Hello, and welcome to my talk about young British artists, sexuality, gender, and veganism, art or obscenity. Let me give you a brief introduction, a socio-historical and cultural context to the artistic activity of young British artists or the representatives of the so-called Brit art. First of all, their art is very controversial as it involves issues such as feminism, sexuality, gender stereotypes, but it enhances globalization in art as it tackles universal issues of life, death, but also love. The uh, young British artists with their um, art created a new image of Britishness, breaking up with the provincial character and insularity um, of British art with, it, with which it used to be um, traditionally associated. It, it gave an air of, um, their art gave an air of contemporariness, appealing to international audience, influencing the image of cool Britannia that um, used to be or still is associated with, for example, Spice Girls, but also with the government of um, Tony's Blair. Um, the artists use mass media and material from mass culture. Their art is, is present in popular and mass culture. For example, Damien, Damien Hirst works are often mentioned in soap operas and quiz shows. These artists have become personalities. The way they present their work is spectacular. There is always an element of sensation associated with their work. Thanks to the, their artistic activity and the way that their art is presented, suddenly art became available for everyone. Our art has lost its elitist character. Uh, as it was constantly exposed in the media and thus was made more easily um, comprehensible and accessible to the public. A huge role in this process was also played by Tate Modern Art Gallery, which was established in the year 2000 in an old electric power station. And it was much more than just an art gallery. You didn't go there just to see art, to go to art exhibitions, but also to have uh, coffee or lunch with your friends, to meet up with people, but also to go shopping because there are many cafes, restaurants, shops, so it's, it's much more than just an art gallery. It's more of a, a social um, and cultural place to enjoy. And of course, you can also go and see art if, if you want to, but it's not a, a necessity. So in that way, um, Tate Modern contributed to popularizing art and to uh, facilitating access to, to art. Um, Brit art also changed the traditionally held opinion of British art. British art was no longer, no longer conservative, but Britain actually came to be seen as the world's leader in artistic innovation. Um, however, uh, their art uh, is often criticized um, for being trivial, for being money oriented, uh, brutal and blasphemic. For actually, uh, Damien Hirst in particular, as you will see later, was often criticized for not producing the art by himself, but um, employing um, a group of assistants who, who, who made his art for him. Okay, um, let me give you now a, a little political, socio-political context to their emergence, which was the late 80s, 1980s. So the situation in the UK in the 1980s was very difficult for art, which was related to the conservative politics of the Thatcher government, which reduced funding for art. There was economic recession, which led to the collapse of art market in London, which at the same time was producing a large number of artists who needed places where they could show and exhibit their work for public display. Um, yet, in this difficult scene, the YBAs emerged. Now, the name 
YBAs or Young British Artists refers to a group of artists and graduates from the Goldsmiths College of Art and you have the name of the college on my slide. Um, initially the group included a few names only and you have the names as well so we have Damien Hurst first of all, Gary Hume, Julian Opie, Fiona Ray, Mark Willinger, Matthew Coldeshaw and Sarah Lucas. However, the group was continually expanding, attracting new members such as Tracy Emin or Chris O'Filly, who soon became personalities in Britain. The major link between all these member artists was the experience of having studied, studied at the Goldsmiths, which was at, this, at the time the most avant-garde, the most innovative art school in Britain. Students there were not limited by the division of the curriculum and could choose any course they wanted to. That was, of course, offered by the school. For example, painting, sculpture, video art, performance art. They didn't have to study just one course, but they could mix courses from various disciplines. So um, um, such a wide scope of course availability encourage them to explore all these disciplines as well as enhanced the interdisciplinary character of their endeavor. Um, this innovation challenged the traditionally devised genre division and classification, prompting the young artists to work in the spirit of conceptualism. So conceptual art is quite quite an important term here. Now, Martin Craig Martin was their teacher of greatest influence. He was a conceptual artist himself who familiarized his students with concepts of modern art. He did not stress the importance of any particular style, but the idea rooted in everyday experience and context of the past. John Thompson, head of fine arts at Goldsmiths, who designed this new system of education, was another inspiring person, personality for the young British artists. The major <clears throat> characteristic, um, uh, the, sorry, the major characteristic feature of uh, young British artists uh, and their art was their own interpretation of Marcel Duchamp's aesthetics of ready-mades but also conceptualism, postmodern interpretation of painting and sculpture, new approaches to the use of modern technology. This was the onset of the new kind of art in which the artists resorted to different means such as the media, surroundings, their private lives and gossip to promote themselves and their work. Now let's uh, let's uh, talk about the beginnings of the young British artist activity. So we have to talk uh, to mention Damien Hirst here because he was uh, he was the initiator of the movement. He was in his second year um, of the Goldsmiths College, and because, as I said earlier, there were very very limited opportunities for young artists to exhibit their work. Um, in, by, in public or established galleries, he came up with an idea to hold an exhibition that would represent his and his fellow students' work of, works of art. Hearst would be the main organizer of the show entitled Freeze. As commercial galleries in London showed no interest in displaying these works, it was staged in one of the warehouses in the London's abandoned Dockland area, which now is very trendy, very popular, but back then it was, it was um, very much forgotten and neglected. <clears throat> Modest setting and rusty and obscure atmosphere well reflected the ideas behind the works themselves. Moreover, the very setting challenged the traditionally perceived con um, con concept of a place where art ought to be displayed. It corresponded well with the innovative character of the works on the show. However, Freeze was a more professional showing of, this, of the student's achievement, 
unlike other student exhibitions that were taking place in the UK at the same time. It had an important effect in the shaping of the curator's role in contemporary exhibition trends, for it established the so-called artist as curator, signifying that it was the artist himself who ran his own exhibitions. Such tendency was quite popular on the London art scene in the 1990s. With a limited budget, the artists managed to publish the exhibition catalogue and send invitations to respected galleries and collectors alike. Therefore, we can see that Fries posed a major challenge to the art establishment, questioning the powers of critics and curators by creating their own space and writing their own catalogue. Although Fries uh, did not receive any essential coverage in the press, what is important is that it was visited by Charles Saatchi, who, was, who still is a major contemporary art collector. And he was, he's also an owner of a major advertising agency. And he's an ex-husband of Nigella Lawson, which you may know. Unlike most of the collectors so far, who tended to collect artists who were long dead and famous, Saatchi broke the mold, for he decided to collect untested and controversial art of his own times, produced by young experimental artists. He was very excited himself by the idea of discovery, by the novelty of this art. And he had an endless appetite for the new. Now, among the diverse range of exhibits, um, displayed and freeze, some had already the power to unnerve. Matt, Matt Collishaw's close-up close photograph of a bullet hole piercing a human head, entitled Bullet Hole, illuminated from behind in an advertising light box, was a haunting and terrifying image. It actually inspired the exhibition's uh, arresting name, for the catalogue declared that Collishaw's bullet hole was, quote, dedicated to a moment of impact, a preserved now, a freeze frame, unquote. In the early 90s, 1990s, Hearst, together with some other friends, curated two other warehouse student shows entitled Modern Medicine and Gambler. They succeeded in raising £1,000 from art world figures, including Charles Saatchi. Apparently, Saatchi was very impressed with what he saw at Gambler and decided to buy um, Hearst's major installation from there, entitled A Thousand Years, consisting of a large glass case containing maggots and flies feeding off a rotting cow's head. Another very gruesome and morbid image, isn't it? The glass case, as you can see, is split in half by a glass wall. And there, is, there are some holes in this partition which allow flies from the box to fly into the other half. The large white cube, <clears throat> which is reminiscent of a die, has only one dot on each face, unlike usual dies which have different numbers of dots. This one has only one, which can be interpreted as you cannot win. You cannot win with death. You cannot win with life. <clears throat> Now, the flies are actually um, feeding off uh, the dead cow's head, but there is also um, an electrifying um, electrocutor um, which kills off the flies. You can see this, this mechanism hang hanging down. It's an electrifying, it's an electrocutor that kills off um, excessive numbers of flies. And the flies 
keep eating and um, hatching eggs, um, um, laying eggs and, and, and new maggots um, hatch from these eggs. Um, and actually when the meat is the, the meat is decaying, it's rotting all the time. And when it's gone, when it's finally rotten, um, they replace it with a new cow's head. So it continues. The smell in the gallery is horrendous, um, but that's that's this um, the idea behind it, right? The, the, co the, co the contrast between the organic, the organic content of this work and the, the, the sterile and the clean setting of an art gallery. This work <clears throat> reveals her obsession with death and life, with the morbid, with animal decay. And it, it uh, involves issues such as inevitability of death and human attempts to escape their final destiny, as well as victory over death. The, this, this is a minimalist work of art um, and it, it explores the rela a relationship between something sterile, as I said, and something organic. So there is this really huge um, shock because you are used to an art gallery, especially a modern art gallery, being something very, very sterile, very clean, very, um, very specifically clean. Whereas this work is, you know, it just smells. There's a horrendous smell, and it 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 really poses a huge um, challenge to the visitor as well. Now, the title of this work, A Thousand Years, is important for it is a metaphor for a trap, okay, a trap of generations into which every being is caught, every human being, every animal, every, everything, every living creature. Now, Sachi bought that work, he was fascinated with it, and from now on, uh, he came to be the main collector and patron of the young British artists. Um, he displayed the works in a series of exhibitions held in his own Sachi gallery in North London, and he was the one who coined the term young British artists precisely to refer to this group of artists whom he exhibited. The first of these was a show of 1992, when Hearst's notable a physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living, or the, the so-called shark, was exhibited and constructed with Sachi's financial support. The title of this work is strongly connected with literature and evokes metaphysical poetry. It is a shark um, kept in formal dehyde. Um, it uh, Hearst claimed that it was already dead when he bought it, so he he didn't kill the animal for the purpose of this um, work of art. But still, uh, the work um, is very controversial because of the ethical aspect of, of, of the work. As the, these sharks are, um, well, they live only around the shores of Australia and they are um, endangered species. Now, the work um, relates to um, the concept of the Natural History Museum, where you go and you look at some um, dead animals and other organs and, and objects from the natural world, usually kept in formaldehyde, to, to look at them. Um, it also refers to the seascape tradition of British painting. Now, usually the shark, when you hear about the sharks, it's usually um, an unattainable animal, right? You cannot easily go and just look at it and see it. To most people, it was unattainable. But here, suddenly it becomes readily available in an art gallery. So this work was designed according to the ideas which function in contemporary culture, such as sensation and the news character of a work of art. It was designed in a way to attract people's attention. So people suddenly were excited and curious to see um, a shark that only lives around Australia 
and usually is, is very difficult to be seen. Of course, there is a problem of art conservation, which actually mm, uh, happens to all of Hearst's works, as you will see, because most of them contain dead animals. Um, because the shark is decaying, right? So they, the shark has to be replaced every few years. Although the work is highly modern in its form, the idea reaches back to the beginnings of museum history. The so-called Kunstkammer, which is the, the origins of, of museum itself, where uh, different objects, not only paintings, but actually stones, shells, bones, interesting objects found in the natural world, were collected at royal courts and kept in a special room for public display. Indeed, this shark seems to be an object taken out of a Kunstkammer, hence evokes the origins of museums. The fact that such a prominent collector as Sachi openly supported young British artists had an influence on other collectors' choice when it came to selecting works of uh, their own collections. And this undoubtedly contributed to the growth and fame of young British artists, attracting more and more artists to join the group. They came to be known as young, confident and strong people who knew how to make an impression on the public and how to acquire a status of a celebrity. It was not always the works of the artists that contributed to the public image, which was growing stronger, but also their personalities, which owed them um, popularity of a pop star. And just to show you some more examples of Damien Hirst's works, um, this is um, Mother and Child Divided. And so just um, a section, a cross section of a dead cow's body. <clears throat> or Infinite Wisdom, which is a calf with five legs. Um, or this, Away from the Flock. Uh, interestingly, Hearst would always give very metaphysical, very philosophical titles to his uh, installations. Although the, the object itself seems to be quite simple uh, in terms of not involving much of his input um, artistically. But yes, it is said that um, critics say that um, Hearst actually moved away from observing animals dying, like you could see in a thousand years, uh, to the portrayal of dead animals. His trademark dead animal sculptures explore the idea of and the disparity of what we eat and where it comes from. And this is done, this was done, remember, in the context of the um, mad cow disease in Britain. Um, so people st stopped, were not so um, keen on eating beef in particular. But actually farmers um, were apparently very pleased and very grateful to us because apparently his works um, raised interest in British uh, meat again, in British lamb and um, beef. But, of course, these works are also highly disturbing in that they reveal the fragile nature of animals and our own bodies. There were numerous protests from animal rights activists and vegans and vegetarians. Um, they didn't like his work. They, they, they really found it uh, appalling. Um, but he... Um, he, he continued producing them. Um, now this, another uh, sculpture by uh, Hearst, this um, bronze statue signed by Saint Bartholomew, an exquisite pain from Beyond Limits exhibition at the Royal Academy. We can see a man um, holding his own skin over his arm. Um, and he's brandishing a scapel and a pair of scissors, strongly suggesting that he has just mutilated himself. St. Bartholomew was one of the 12 apostles who, according to, to, uh, to, to tradition, uh, was skinned alive in Armenia. 
Hers said of this latest creation that he uh, that the work comes from woodcuts and etchings I remember seeing when I was younger. As he was a martyr who was skinned alive, he was often used by artists and doctors to show human anatomy." Unquote. Interestingly, Hurst said that his work was also a, an, a homage to Tim Burton's gothic 1990 film Edward Scissorhands, starring Johnny Depp. And he said, well, Hurst said that, um, quote, I added the scissors because I thought Edward Scissorhands was in a similarly tragic yet difficult position, he said, unquote. So, you know, this kind of um, comparing a saint, um, a Christian saint with a, a film uh, character is quite controversial in itself already. Plus, you know, the morbid and the, the, the cruel character of this work adds to its difficult nature. Another work by Hess is The Virgin Mother, which is um, 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 one of the biggest bronzes in the world. And this statue reveals the insides of a pregnant woman that have, has been <clears throat> standing, uh, has been unveiled at the Royal Academy in London. The Virgin Mother has li layers removed on one side to reveal the fetus and the woman's skull, muscles and tissues. That bronze statue recalls, um, as you can see in the slide, Edgar Degas, Degas a little dancer, because the pose is quite similar. And it dominates the courtyard in uh, front of the gallery uh, in Piccadilly. In a sense, this work <clears throat> contradicts her obsessions um, with death, and it's quite it's said that it's life affirming because there is a little baby involved. So it's a it's a confirmation of life. Another work, the famous skull, which at which once was was the most expensive work of art in the world, not anymore, but uh, some years ago. It's a life-size size platinum cast of an 18th century human skull covered by diamonds and inset with the original skull's teeth. At the front, we have a large um, pink diamond. And again, it represents the artist's continued interest in mortality and notions of value of art as well. Alluding to the iconography of the skull, um, in art, it's a memento mori, a reminder of the fragility of life. And the work can be viewed alternatively as a glorious, devotional, defiant or provocative gesture in the face of death itself. Um, and I, I said earlier that um, about the, 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 the sensation around the works of the young British artists. Um, and the fact that um, they often, um, thanks to their characters and their personalities, um, they achieved so much fame and, uh, and, uh, and gained a celebrity status. Um, well, Tracy Emin, another artist, is, is a good example here. Um, once she, off, she delivered an offensive speech on television uh, under the influence of alcohol. And um, YBA started to receive extensive interest from the media, resulting in some of the artists winning or becoming nominees for the Turner Prize, the famous prize in art, which is the most advertised prize for contemporary artists in Britain. Since Channel 4 became the main sponsor of the prize, Channel 4 is a TV channel, one of the commercial channels, Many of the young British artists had their profiles made and shown on TV in prime time slots. Um, it was launched in 1984 by the Tate Gallery and, as I said, sponsored by Channel 4, as well as private and state donors. It is awarded annually to the artist who is under 50, living and working in Britain and contributing to the innovative character of British art. 
The prize is important in popularizing British art. It has a political character and is usually awarded to artists whose work, works deal with feminism, homosexuality, refugees, war and immigration. There is usually a lot of talk and public interest in the prize as the award ceremony is broadcast live on Channel 4. And one of the most important results of this, of this prize, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, was an increased interest in British art, in the issues of British art and, and modern art. Uh, young British artists were often nominees for the prize or won it in many cases. In 1999, Tracy Emin was nominated for the prize and her main exhibit was My Bed. This work sparked immediate media interest in Emin and her work and heightened her prominence. Emin's art is described as confessional. Drawing on her experiences, Emin examines the nature of sexuality and mortality. With her bed sculpture, which is simply an unmade bed with dirty sheets surrounded by empty bottles and other waste, such as um, her dirty underwear, used condoms, um, for example. Um, te Emin takes everyday dirt and garbage and displays it in an everyday sense, asking, why are we still disgusted by it? Are we hypocritical if we are? The work is made in the Duchamp tradition of a ready-made. However, in the case of Duchamp, his ready-mades were unused, clean and sterile, anonymous, mass-produced industrial objects of everyday use, such as bottle racks, for example, or um, bicycle wheels. In Emin's case, <clears throat> the bed is highly personal and moreover, the final object was made with the use of her own body. She directly intervened in the object. She has become part of that object of art herself. We encounter the artist's personality with the object in this particular installation. Um, thus, the work and the artist herself became um, part of the confessional tendency in culture which is considered some kind of an ex of exhibitionism. Now, we have to know that Tracy Emin has spent, well, spent several weeks in that bed um, with, a, with heavy depression. Uh, she slept there, she had sex there, she had drank a lot of alcohol, etc., etc. Okay, so it's, it, it, it was like after her, her mental breakdown. She was suffering a lot at that period and she wanted to share with us, with the audience, um, the tragic of her, of her um, psychological state. Um, in works of this kind, as the, the, this one for example, Everyone I Have Ever Slept With, which is a patchworked tent, and the artists show part of their person, personal life to the public and manifest the power of their personalities. Thus, Emin's life became the, uh, the object of public interest. In the tent, we have a juxtaposition of a visual and verbal sign, an interplay between words and images. However, uh, you can um, immediately uh, think that it refers to, to to her lovers with, with whom she slept, but actually it's not just her lovers. It includes names of her unborn children, of her uh, brothers and sisters and her friends. So not only her sexual partners, okay? Um, now, Emin's confessional works uh, evoke her psychological states of anger, anguish, fear, but at the same time, they are highly sensational. Now, her self-portrait, I've got it all, is a commentary to her success, which would suggest that she made a lot of money and um, she was very successful because of, her, of, of the connection of her art to her sexuality. 
Um, artist biography is, of course, very important in conceptual art. Many of these artists refer to their own um, personal lives. Whereas in previous eras, in the past, uh, artist biography was often rejected or considered unimportant. But here it is in the, in the very centre of the activity. Now, when you discuss Emin's work, you have to mention, you have to remember that her childhood and her puberty were very painful and very difficult for her. Um, she experimented with alcohol, drugs and sex. And she had um, some miscarriages and abortions. She was raped. And actually many young girls in the UK um, identified themselves with her. Um, hence, um, we can see here this therapeutic, uh, therapeutic meaning of art. So uh, to sum up, one can say that gender identity is strongly reflected in Emin's works. Now, Turner's prize often, sco often causes scandal. In the year 2001, it was given to Martin Creed, whose work, Lights Going On and Off, provoked outrage of the public. It presents an empty white space of a gallery of a high-tech style, recalling the op art tradition. In the work, the light is manifested, but there is no art object, no craft in the traditional sense. It's, it is just an empty room in which lights go on and off. It is known as a site-specific installation work adjusted to a given gallery space. In this case, it was Tate Modern. And it's a commentary to this particular place. This work is based on the development of a certain idea. Such art is open to all kinds of commentary and thus forces people to think about it. For example, every five seconds someone dies as the lights go on and off every five seconds. The context is very important here. It's a contextual formation of art which is dismantled after the show is finished. So this is art in context. This is another, um, another picture by uh, Marcus Harvey from 1995. Um, and it was um, exhibited um, at an exhibition called Sensation at the Royal Academy, which is probably not the best place to, to show such, such experimental works, because Royal Academy is usually associated with conservative, with traditional art. But there it happened, um, it was displayed there. Now, why is this work so controversial? It's a monumental painting of children murderer, Myra Hindley. Hindley. Now, would you show, would you make a portrait of a child murderer? Um, well, it is actually covered with children's handprints, so that's how it's made. <clears throat> the visitors to the exhibition were outraged and they were actually throwing eggs and ink at the picture to show their protest, as they felt forced to face again the tragedy of the parents whose uh, children had been killed by her. Um, now, when the exhibition toured to New York, the greatest protest was provoked by Chris Ophelia's work, The Holy Virgin, which depicted a black figure of Holy Virgin covered with elephant dung and pornographic images cut out from pornographic magazines. Um, Mel Giuliani of New York City threatened the Brooklyn Museum where it was displayed with closure and, sl and slashed the city's several million dollars public subsidy to the museum if they refuse to remove the work from display. Now, Ophelia, you have to know that he's an African artist and um, um, his work, his art is strongly rooted in African culture and emphasizes the attachment of the Africans to nature where elephant dung is considered holy and sacred. 
but it also refers to the fact that the whole cult of Mary is erotic as Ophili thinks. And he, he often mentions um, the hidden eroticism in the Bible and the hidden um, sexuality um, within Christian sensibility. So you should um, really analyze his work in this context. Now, um, these artists, Jake and Dinas Chapman, um, provide a commentary to the negative aspect of capitalism. In this work, DNA Zygotic is a sculpture of horrifically mutated children with three to five legs, sexual organs in their faces, and nine to three heads. And we are asked by this work, rather abruptly. If this is the future, are we head heading towards creating monsters <clears throat> by developing DNA, cloning or weapons development? It was made during the time when uh, scientists were experimenting with cloning, when we had dolly, sheep and so on. That was very, um, very popular in Britain. Another piece by these artists um, is zygotic acceleration, which refers to biogenetic and apocalyptic vision of our future. The work consists of a line of young girl fiber glass mannequins merged into one model, creating one darkly ghostly monster. They're all connected. And the end of each leg is adorned with a black sneaker which have a stabbing aroma of menace. They look very threatening. This work points to the ever omnipresent corrupting force of the global media and advertising campaigns on young girls. It says that these influences are turning girls into one faceless nanism. Individualism was wiped from their individual psyches. And the sneakers suggest that they could turn into an army of killers at any time, eliminating those who don't fit. So it's capitalism gone wrong. It's a commentary on excessive sexualization of girls. And this is uh, another installation by, um, by this artist called Übermensch, of course, showing the scientist Stephen Hawking towering on a three meter high fiberglass mountain, alluding to his, um, um, his genius really, right? But also the fact that he is uh, disabled. Now, another in, important artist, member of the YBAs is Jenny Saville, who uh, unlike most of them actually stayed loyal to painting. Jenny Saville explores the workings of the flesh in her monumental paintings of fleshly nudes which wallow in the glory of expansiveness. Jenny Saville is a real painter's painter. She constructs painting with the weighty heft of sculpture. Her exaggerated nudes point up with an agonizing frankness. The disparity between the way women are perceived and the way they feel about their bodies. One of the most striking aspects of Jenny Saville's work is the sheer physicality of it. Saville paints skin with all the subtlety of a Swedish massage, which is violent, painful, bruising, almost bone crunching. Saville calls herself a scavenger of images. She prefers to work from photographs rather than living models. Her studio is a repository of images from old medical journals of bruises, scars, images of deformities and disease. In her work, she questions society's obsession with the idealized, almost robotic image of the female form. We can see images of extreme humanness that are so out of place in our anxious culture, obsessed with eternal youth and beauty. 
Savile confronts the essence of what it means to have an active mind and a decaying body. Her paint becomes flesh as it evokes um, the feel and touch of the body, its smell and material presence. Her gargant gargantuan figures are freed from the conventions of feminine delicacy as the paintings impose themselves on the viewer who cannot escape their physical being. Um, now moving on uh, to Sarah Lucas, um, who is one of the best known British artists um, whose challenge is also sexual stereotypes in her work. Um, using sculpture, photography and installations, Lucas denies the idea that sex is disgusting. Her art attempts to reflect life as it is lived, messy, funny, pathetic, and full of contradictions. Lucas makes sculptures from a heterogeneous and unexpected range of everyday materials, such as worn furniture, clothing, fruit, vegetables, newspapers, cigarettes, cars, resin, um, and light fittings. The grungy, uh, miserable appearance of many of her works belies the serious and complex subject matter they address. She makes constant reference to the human body, questioning gender definitions and challenging macho culture. This approach is represented in this work, Au Naturel, from 1994, which consists of a mattress on which an empty bucket and a couple of melons represent female genitalia, while the male is represented by a cucumber and a pair of oranges. Similarly, Lucas makes provocative self-portraits that question traditional depictions of women and challenge the cliched image of the modern artist in works such as self-portrait with fried eggs. Now, adding to her series of anthropomorphic furniture down below, is an old metal bathtub, its drain doubling as a vagina from which flesh-colored paint seeped into the gallery floor in a tra traumatic uh, image of self-induced abortion. The kiss, again made from old furniture and cigarettes, and then I wanted to talk about this work, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which is Lucas's body of vulgar humor taking on a darker turn. Um, she uses a variety of, of household objects here to produce a witty metaphor for sexual activity. However, the comic references contrast um, with the sobering presence of the cardboard coffin, which you can see under, underneath the mattress. The title, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, <clears throat> refers to a seminal text by the psych psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who suggested that the drive for life is matched by an equal and oppressive drive for death so that pleasure is bound up with destruction. So this is the last work to show you today. Um, as you can see, these um, works by the young British artists are very controversial, but also very um, universal because they appeal to universal issues um, and problems um, and notions um, of sexuality, gender, life and death, as well as uh, more recent um, issues of veganism, for example. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, thank you very much for coming.